thank you for joining us and welcome to this program entitled Vulnerable Populations and Mental Health in Times of Health Crisis, which is proposed by LIFE Graduate School. This is part of the series on vulnerability and COVID-19. My name is uh, Geneviève Durumeau. I am professor in physiology and I am the coordinator of this graduate school. And I have the immense pleasure to be today with Professor Marion Le Boyer, who is professor in psychiatry in uh, uh, University Paris Créteil. And uh, she has been uh, recently awarded Grand Prix INSEM 2021. So uh, congratulations Marion again for this great achievement. We are all very proud for you and for our institution. She's also a leader in the in very renowned in the world in psychiatry disorders, and she is uh, the coordinator of Fundamental Foundation. So just to start, uh, uh, Marion, uh, your life uh, is focusing on the topic on vulnerability, uh, which is known to be linked to multiple factors, such as health, of course, but also environmental, social, economic, even political and cultural conditions. So how do you integrate in your practice the question on vulnerability uh, in psychiatric diseases? So thank you very much for your kind invitation and for your very nice introduction. Uh, your question is absolutely key to better prevent and better treat psychiatric disorders, but I'm not sure it's already implemented in everyday care. However, it's a major uh, issue in terms of research, and in particular in the field that uh, I will describe to uh, explain this vulnerability, which is called immunopsychiatry. And in this field, we are very keen on trying to identify all the elements which can help us to better uh, take into account all the vulnerability factors that explain this low-grade inflammation, which is associated to psychiatric disorders, at least subgroups of these patients, and which is uh, described as uh, having both genetic factors, such as uh, haplotype associated to HLA system or toll-like receptors, which probably explain that we are not all equal when confronted to different environmental risk factors that occur all through the life uh, span of uh, a person. And these different environmental factors are described on the, on the slide. Uh, they start by early infections, and this is particularly relevant in this uh, time where we are uh, within a pandemic. It's also true of autoantibodies disorders occurring in, in mothers. Uh, the second environmental factors is related to dysbiosis, which is the, the intestinal flora. It's also related to pollution, and in particular air pollution uh, during early lifetime. Also severe stress, low social e economic status, lifestyle, and in particular diet or physical activity and somatic uh, health. So all these factors interact with our genetic uh, background to induce the occurrence of different psychiatric disorders and to produce different type of inflammation, both in the gut, in the blood and in the brain. Thank you. This, this raises the issue of health trajectories uh, and health trajectories is, uh, is a key challenge now to detect and understand the uh, molecular changes that are going to trigger the deviation from healthy trajectories towards pathology and drive cells, organs, tissues towards disease. So I'm sure that you, you share the opinion that an important goal in medicine should be to intercept the disease sufficiently early to prevent irreparable damage. How can you explain us, can you explain us, sorry, how suffering from a psychiatric disease may impact per se health trajectories? So that different ways to answer your, your very important question. First, uh, we are starting to better describe psychiatric disorders exactly in the same way as we describe cancer or cardiovascular disorder by stages and by trajectories. This is something very new in psychiatry. And uh, in this slide, we have been able to follow patients, uh, a, la a large sample of patients, and to assess them regularly. And doing that, we have been able to identify different trajectories, patients that improve very regularly, patients that stay stable and patients that uh, are getting very severely worse. 
And the interesting point related to vulnerability is that we've been able to identify modifiable factors that on which we can intervene to change these trajectories. And these factors, they are, for example, linked to presence of depressive symptoms, whatever the disorder is that remain without being treated, or the existence of early trauma, the existence of sleep disturbances, of the body mass index, of the fact that some of these patients, they have 10 or more treatments, which is probably too much and too many drug treatment. All these factors can be changed and modified. The other way to answer your question is that now we very well know that we are dealing with global health. And this term of global health means that both the occurrence of psychiatric disorders during a somatic disorder or uh, the occurrence of a somatic disorder during a psychiatric disorders, if they're not treated, if they're not diagnosed together, uh, this has a very bad prognosis. So it's very important to stop having uh, sort of uh, gaps between somatic uh, treatments and psychiatric disorders. It's really important to be specialized, but also to consider health as a global entity, which is something that WHO describe as there is no health without mental health. I, I think that we completely agree on uh, the cross talk between uh, the uh, uh, somatic and psychiatry has dev- for, for sure to be developed and enhanced in our, in our practice. And Marion, today uh, we will address a very timely topic uh, which uh, occurs in this context of the pandemic. And uh, um, I would like uh, to, to discuss with you uh, uh, the program which is entitled Vulnerability and Mental Health During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And uh, we will discuss uh, a few educational goals uh, during this program. And uh, these educational goals are listed here We will address first the psychosocial consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Then you will discuss the new onset of psychiatric illness in COVID-19 survivors. And we will end by uh, the worst COVID-19 outcomes in severe uh, mental uh, illness. But to start first um, with the first educational goal, can you detail the psychosocial consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you, Marion. Sure, thank you very much for this very important question. Uh, So this is a slide describing the overall impact in the general population that the COVID-19 pandemic has. And this is a a comparison of, for example, suicidal ideation before the pandemic has started in in, in 2019. You see that it's around 4% and it's increased to 10% during the pandemic. Same for depressive disorder. Before the pandemic, they were around 6% of the population. They increased to 24%. And the same for anxiety disorder uh, from 8% to 25%. So you see that it's really a very, very big change and impact in, in the field. And this is another example of data gathered in the States uh, early April. So it's really at the very beginning of the pandemic where very quickly we saw that there was an increase of three times more depressive symptoms in 2020 compared to 2018. And what is worrying is that the largest increase was observed for severe depression, uh, moving on from 0.7 to 20% during April. And also this is the first study that uh, showed that we were not again all at the same risk to develop these psychiatric disorders because Uh, patients or population that were more at risk are women and uh, people having a low social economic status or being unemployed. Uh, We have done in France several studies to follow the impact on mental health. And this is a first example. We have done two surveys uh, of the mental health impact of the pandemic, one in December 2020 and the other one in September 2021. And there are two conclusions that we should uh, Uh, notice here. First, the very big impact on uh, depression, uh, with 47% of French people uh, experiencing depressive symptoms and 13% uh, with a moderate to severe depressive episode. And this, again, is particularly true in women, where it's observed in 40% of uh, women. And also, this was the first uh, proof that it's also very young people, in particular, those aged between 20, 22, two and 24 years old, and also our colleagues, healthcare providers who reported depressive symptoms. 
And same for anxiety, 42% of French people experience anxiety disorders. And what is also a little bit alarming is that the same figures were observed when we did, again, the same survey with the same questionnaires uh, in September 2021, which was a period post uh, a wave where people felt, uh, again, anxious and very depressed. Uh, this is particularly true in French students, and this was a study published in uh, a, a very good journal in, in psychiatry and measured during April 2022. And we, we saw that 8,000 students were studied. And again, the prevalence of depressive disorders in this young population was much higher than before the pandemic with anxiety, depression, problems to concentrate and suicidal ideation. And again, the same uh, observation that this was particularly true in women, in people in contact with someone infected with COVID uh, and in uh, persons having financial insecurity and students living alone. And this is a focus on another very worrying information, uh, which is the observation that there is one uh, part of the population which has been forgotten at the beginning of the pandemic, which are teenagers. And this shows you uh, in red in the upper part of the slide that teenagers seen in the emergencies in Paris hospital uh, were uh, seen for suicidal ideation and suicidal attempt. And this is only this population of young uh, teenagers who were seen in emergencies during the first lockdown. This is not observed uh, after the age of 15 years. So it's really very specific and probably linked to uh, lots of worrying consequences of the lockdown, but in particular, probably a uh, violent situation. And here is another point uh, of, uh, again, concern, which is the possible psychosocial consequences of the pandemic on he mental health of women before and after pregnancy. And you see here that uh, women who are either before preg during pregnancy, before or after birth, have a very strong increase of anxiety, of depression, and of post-traumatic stress disorders. And this is much higher than the general population during the pandemic, and also uh, when compared with women before this pandemic. So it's really something very worrying because we know that depression, anxiety has some consequences on the future mental health of babies as well. Thank you for this very impressive data. This stress is really the fact that maybe COVID may uncover uh, and, or unmask uh, psychiatric disorders. And then the following question should be, did you observe in your practice new onset of psychiatric illness in COVID-19 survivors? So yes, absolutely. And I'm going to describe this. This again is something which has been observed uh, everywhere in all the cohorts of patients followed after they've had uh, a COVID infection. And this uh, was already known before the infection. And very early in May 2020, there was a meta-analysis published by our colleagues in the States who uh, uh, did this meta-analysis on patients hospitalized for another coronavirus pandemic with SARS-CoV-1 or MERS-CoV. This meta-analysis was done in 65 peer uh, review studies, and it showed already that uh, we needed to be uh, aware of this risk of the coronavirus infection because there, there has been observed a considerable increase of prevalence of anxiety and depressive disorders in survivors of these two pandemics with 15% depression, 15% uh, anxiety disorders and 32 uh, stress, post-traumatic stress disorders in subjects who've never had any psychiatric disorders before these two pandemics. So already we knew from the very beginning uh, of the pandemic that something was to, to be observed, to be followed, and of course to be treated. And then the first papers of the consequences of the COVID infection on uh, survivors of COVID infection was described by our colleagues in Italy who published very early the first study ever published uh, showing that one month and then in the second study, three months after uh, the release for an hospitalization for uh, COVID, there was a very, very impressive increase of new onset of psychiatric disorders one month after the hospitalization. 
they described that 54% of patients had at least one psychiatric disorders, again, anxiety disorders, insomnia, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and a very small number of patients with obsessive compulsive disorder. Again, more, more frequently observed in women, in young adults, in patients having history of psychiatric disorders, and in outpatients. So it's not uh, only related to sev severity of the COVID infection. And then it, they continued this, the follow-up of the same patients and published uh, that three months after the hospitalization, there was a regression of anxiety disorder, but an increase of depression and in particular an increase of, of severity. And now we know that the peak of uh, occurrence of depressive disorder is just six months after the acute infection. And this is, seems to be very specific of COVID. So it's observed after a lot of different uh, infections. But in this study, which was published by Maxim Take in Lancet Psychiatry, uh, this colleague had access to a very, very large database of nearly 70 million patients in the States. And he showed that the risk of psychiatric disorders in patients without psychiatric history was very elevated uh, and more elevated when compared to the risk associated to other disorders, in particular influenza or other disorders. So it seems to be very specific uh, of COVID infection. And what he found is that the risk of any psychiatric diagnosis between 14 to 90 days after the infection was extremely elevated, again, in particular for mood uh, symptoms and episodes and anxiety disorder. Then there, were, there was, there's been a, a lot of studies confirming this observation and showing that, uh, for example, in this very large study, that 34% of patients were diagnosed with a neurological or psychiatric condition up to six months after the infection. And th this was much more elevated than with, uh, for example, after the flu. So this is a summary of the hypothesis to try to explain why there is such a, an important impact of the SARS-CoV-2 in the brain. And it's just hypothesis, but they're slowly being confirmed. And what is, it shows here is that the SARS-CoV-2 can penetrate in the brain after uh, being uh, linked or uh, to ACE, you know, the angiotensin converting enzyme, and then it can uh, induce a local inflammatory reaction with increased production of cytokine, activation of microglial cells, and then this lead to a whole a cascade, which is very well known in the field of depression, which leads to uh, diminished of neurotransmitters in the brain, which is probably ex an explanation of why there is so many uh, on ongoing depressive episodes after the infection. And there are other elements which are activated by this inflammation and infection in the brain, in particular coagulation cascade, and all the consequences of the neurotransmission and neural da damage with the different uh, disorders, which are probably due to uh, the, the, the localization of the, the, the infection in the brain. And there's been a very recent publication in Nature la in last December uh, showing in the, 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 co the COVID-19 has a systemic action on different organs uh, in the body with a very wide distribution a uh, long time after the onset of the infection, up to seven months following the symptom infection. Of course, the, the virus is observed in multiple pul pulmonary and also extra pulmonary tissues. And what is very impressive in this paper is that it very clearly shows that among the different regions, the brain is implicated. And they were very surprised because they didn't find such an important inflammation locally. So basically what we have to keep in mind to answer your question, uh, Geneviève is that the mental consequences of COVID-19 are probably in front of us. We are in the middle of it, but it's probably on the way to continue because if we don't diagnose these patients, the risk is that they're going to develop some chronic disorders. We very well know that depression is a disorder that can be treated, but like any chronic condition, it needs to be diagnosed and treated uh, very early on. 
And from the patients that we both follow in the co-vulnerability study, uh, I can tell you that the patients are not diagnosed and they don't dare to talk about their symptoms of anxiety or depression. And they're not, the link between infection and depression is not something which is straightforward and not very well known in the general population. And so they don't understand that there is any link between COVID infection and the occurrence of new psychiatric disorders. Thank you, Marion. And uh, since you mentioned our collaborative study in, uh, in uh, co-vulnerability, which is following uh, uh, the patients having suffered from uh, COVID-19, we are currently focusing on those patients having hospitalized with severe symptoms of COVID-19. And sometimes it's difficult to uh, make the difference between uh, the post-traumatic uh, experience in intensive care and the impact of COVID-19 per se. So this is very important. And do you think that worse COVID-19 outcomes are associated with severe mental illness? Or do you think that uh, the any patients suffering from COVID-19 may experience such severe mental illness? So this is really a, my, my third message. We have repeatedly demonstrate what I'm going to describe, which is that patients having severe mental illness when they got infected by COVID have a worse outcome that, than the general population. This has been repeatedly demonstrated and not very well heard by, by policymakers. So first it's been described very early on that the risk of being infected by COVID in people having a mental disorder is increased and this was described and, and the figure is close to a six points increase in these patients. The second uh, very important fact is that not only they are more at risk of being infected, but they are twice more at risk of having a severe form of COVID infection. And this is the second message. And of course, linked to this message, twice they are twice at risk, higher risk of mortality. So this is really important because at the beginning of the first and the second vaccination, they were not considered as priority uh, population, and they are. And this has been very difficult to, to uh, not to demonstrate because all the papers published uh, demonstrated this, but the governments in the different European countries had, uh, it was, uh, took them a long time to realize the, these figures. And this is a, a paper meta-analysis that we just published uh, in Lancet Psychiatry, where we demonstrated uh, in a meta-analysis, including 23 studies with a very large sample size, again and again, that having any mental disorders put patients at risk uh, of dying from COVID. And this is particularly true in bipolar patients and in psychotic patients. So this is really something to keep in mind uh, because it's not something which is very well known. So uh, there are several immediate actions to be taken to face the consequences of COVID on mental health. First, uh, it needs to be repeated that uh, among patients, survivors of COVID-19, one out of five will develop a mental disorders within 90 days after the infection. So we really need to develop long COVID consultation and to get funded to create platforms because probably we'll never have the manpower to be able to uh, diagnose and treat all these patients, but platforms uh, and digital tools are extremely efficient to help us to diagnose them and treat them. The second uh, fact to be reminded is that pre-existence mental, mental disorder put patients at risk of having severe or fatal COVID-19 illness. So we need to pay extra care to this vulnerable population by making information, education, and improving access to somatic care. And the third point is that we now start to know that COVID-19 has long-term impact on the brain, and we need to support research on the brain consequences of COVID, and probably also on the development of specific treatment to prevent this major public health impact. So the take home message uh, once again is that COVID-19 has a major impact of mental health. Uh, also probably in terms of uh, vulnerability, it's clear that the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the general population is particularly strong and true in women, in young adults, in subjects having a low socioeconomic status and job loss, and also, as we have just seen, on patients infected by COVID, whatever the severity of the infection, it's true of patients being hospitalized or not hospitalized. 
It's also uh, important to see that patients with pre-existing mental disorders are at risk of severe COVID, at risk of psychiatric relapse, and need to be vaccinated. And to face the expected increase of new cases of psychiatric patients, we really need to improve information, reduce stigma, uh, improve detection, uh, and in particular by general practitioners, and we need to create dedicated COVID psychiatric consultation and dedicated platform. And we need to support research on the links between COVID and psychiatric disorders. And just to conclude, uh, here is a, a list of papers that I have referred to during my uh, talk. And, and they're all published in very, very big journals, so easy to find. And on the, the sl small uh, diagram on the right, I just wanted to mention that surprisingly, uh, there is the, the highest number of papers published uh, during the COVID pandemic uh, was on mental health. So this is something very surprising and very new. There's really been during this pandemic an increased interest uh, on mental health, uh, both in terms of publication, but also in terms of communication. So thank you very much to have let me explain and describe this impact. Thank you very much, Marion, for this uh, in-depth uh, overview of uh, the uh, impact of COVID-19 in mental health diseases. And uh, we are convinced that it's a key area for research. Uh, yourself uh, and your team have benefited from a, 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 a PhD grant for three years. You were the first to obtain it and uh, we are very glad uh, to, uh, 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 to, to, to announce that uh, we have a, a next course both for master's student, but also for PhD. OER uh, is a graduate program, which is offering this uh, grant allocation. You have understood from this uh, discussion and presentation today from uh, Marion, that uh, this is a, a, a very important field of research that we have uh, um, on site uh, in UPEC, the facilities and the expertise in order to uh, work on this topic with a joint life sharing their efforts in constituting a cohort and working on new markers of the disease, working on the uh, health vulnerability, but also health trajectories. And uh, hopefully uh, we will uh, interest, get, get your interest in joining us in this program. So we have now reached the end of our program, which was entitled Vulnerable Population and Mental Health in Times and Health Crisis proposed by the Life Graduate School. I thank you very much for joining us. And I would like again to congratulate Marion Le Boyer for this uh, wonderful lecture, but also for our, our recent uh, uh, award as a uh, uh, Grand Prix in SEM. And uh, this is uh, uh, not, not, uh, not a, uh, an easy task. So uh, again, congratulations, Marion. Thank you very much. Bye.